Well, first of all, thanks for doing this. We really do appreciate it. Oh, sure. It's my pleasure. Well, speaking of your pleasure, as I was watching, and we were going to eavesdrop it here, I noticed the a rapport, the rapport that you were having with Dr. Taylor, and you two look like you were having just the time of your lives. Yeah, um, I must say that we do enjoy playing uh, together. Um, we go back a bit. I was recording my first, very first album, and Billy Taylor was in town playing a club that we aspired to play. Later on, we, we did play London House. And he knew a, a jazz disc jockey there by the name of Daddy O'Daly at the time. And um, Daddy said, well, I'm going to bring somebody. In fact, Daddy O'Daly had, had set up our recording session for us. So he said, I'm going to bring somebody by to, to say hello to you tomorrow at your session. And it was Billy Taylor. Um, it's the first time I met him, and that was 1956, 57, somewhere in there. And he was such a warm person. He sat down at the piano, and he played a little bit, and he wished us luck. And from that point on, uh, we became friends. Um, and I, it's a joy to play with Billy Taylor, because he's, he's met a lot of people, and he's done a lot of things, and he's got a wealth of knowledge, so I always draw from him. One of the things he said about you a little bit earlier was that he said he liked the fact that you looked into all sorts of different music to draw your inspiration from your classical training to you know, blues to church music. Uh, he said, this is a guy who's not content to imitate other people. He goes out and finds his own thing to do. Is that a pretty good statement about you? He said that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have never really looked into my style until the last several years. Uh, people have always asked me, you know, where did you get your style? How did you get your style? But people like Billy Taylor, Dizzy Gillespie, Maurice White, a couple others, got my attention by saying, you know, the time that you spent playing in church, which is considerable, and the time you, I still studied the classics, but I started taking piano lessons at four years old, and it was all classical. In fact, by the time I was 11, 12, 13, it was going to be Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven around the world, concertized. At that same time, I was going to a, a multicultural high school. I mean, there was kids from Eastern Europe, Western Europe, from um, all over the world that were going to that high school. It was a public school. Um, and so their culture uh, was, was exposed to me uh, during the high school period. Also, now this is all from, say, nine years old to... 13, 14 years old. So there's gospel music, there's classical music, there's pop music. I mean, Rosemary Clooney as well as Billie Holiday and Perry Como as well as Nat Cole and, and Lester Young, all this stuff. Um, Dad brought home some jazz records, and he was really into Art Tatum and other pianists, Dorothy Donegan and, and, and Earl Father Hines, Count Basie, Duke Ellington. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but it was there. And the, the great thing about it was during that period, none of my teachers, none of my parents, none of my relatives, none of the people very close to me that were making an effect on me said, don't play that kind of music or don't listen to that kind of music. If I liked it, I absorbed it. And so here, years later, I see that gospel, um, classical, European classical, um, and pop music um, comes out in my style in my own way. In fact, early on when I had those first hit records, The In Crowd and Wade in the Water and all that, people called me a funk. And so the point you were making is that you were able to draw from all sorts of areas. That's right. A matter of fact, during those um, first records that I had, uh, In Crowd and um, Wade in the Water and all that, people used to say that I was this funky piano player, which was a word we didn't use at home in those days. Now it's acceptable what it was. And actually, it wasn't. I mean, I accepted it then, although for something inside me says, well, I don't think so. But I used to think it was maybe a blues, because Chicago's a big blues town. But now I realize that it's actually the gospel influence that's coming out at me from time to time. Um, so, what is my style? I don't know. It's the way I feel at that moment. Who inspired you as a young man? 
Mm. Talking about your dad bringing home a box of jazz records. Yeah. The early in the people that inspired me early on that I can recall now would be dad, who was a hard worker, who went to church who believed in honesty, sincerity, loved music. See, that's another thing that I didn't, I, it was always there, but it wasn't until these last several years that I realized that Dad played a lot of classical music at home as well as, as uh, jazz music, and then there was the gospel. So in a way, I'm, 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 I'm a reflection of, of what he was doing in those days. So Dad, definitely. Mom, very sensitive person, very compassionate. Not that Dad wasn't, but... Mom was very sensitive, very practical. She loved music, but there's these other things you cons should consider too. And I'm so glad that she, she didn't insist, but just by her, the way she lived her life, she used to read the Bible, but she used to read everything. Mom liked to read. I said, okay, that should be interesting. And, and what she, before I traveled a lot, she thought that, well, you could travel in your mind. If you read, you can expose yourself to different things. And I think that that's so important in what I do and what artists try to do in portraying life through their music, that you expose yourself to other than the piano, in my case. Uh, so, Mom, Dad, I, I've got to say that Dorothy Mendelssohn my uh, second piano teacher. I, I, I studied with Ernestine Bruce, who was our church organist at four years old. And at, at 11, she, or 9 or 10, somewhere in there, she told my parents, I've taught him all I can teach him. I suggest you take him downtown to Chicago, Chicago Musical College. Dorothy Mendelssohn, up until Dorothy Mendelssohn, the piano was something that I kind of had to do. Dad said, you got to practice. I didn't... I thought you just, when four, five, six years old, I thought you went once a week and took this 20-minute piano lesson, and all the kids would say, ah, he takes piano lessons. I knew he had to practice. So it was, a, it was a chore. Dorothy Mendelssohn would say things like, listen with your inner ear. She would say things like, yeah, I want you to learn technique, but it's just a means to an end. Oh, really? I thought you learned to play fast because you dazzled, dazzled them with your footwork. Oh, no, 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 no. You learn your technique so that you don't have to think about technique as you are betraying this music, as you're playing this music. Dorothy Mendelssohn, very important person, um, hands-on person. Now there are other influences, people that I've met that influenced me uh, through their music. I met Duke Ellington, very influential. I didn't know Duke Ellington, but I knew his music, and when I met him, it was... Here he is, Nat Cole. Nat Cole, the piano player. I, you know, we, we were all introduced early on to Nat Cole, the singer. Uh, but Dad had brought us home some Nat Clean Cole trio records. And so I knew that he could really play jazz piano. I got to meet him. That influence stayed with me. I've been listening to Nat Cole here recently myself. He was wonderful, wasn't he? He was. And, um, I understand Billy Taylor was telling me that um, he didn't practice all, all the time, that he had this gift to be able to sit down at the piano and just play these wonderful things. In fact, the guitar player in their trio uh, would practice and practice to learn these arrangements and, and keep up with what was going on, and Nat would come in one day and out of the clear blue sky and say, hey, let's play this arrangement. Um, a lot of people don't know that Nat Cole was a very uh, established piano player. One of the things I noticed is you, you two look like you're just having such a wonderful time. And, you know, you were telling me just before we started rolling tape that you were in Hawaii like three days ago, Hartford or wherever it was last night in Connecticut, and here this morning, man, oh, you're tired. Getting in front of the piano again just energizes you. What's it like to play the music you play? <laughs> well, it, it's a music of the moment. It's um, jazz is spontaneous. Jazz is... Um, uh, an immediate expression. People uh, would sometimes say, okay, you love classical music, which I do, and you love jazz, which I do. And sometimes they force me to choose, which I don't. Um, 
But if there's a if there's just a difference, and not meaning one is better or worse, if there's a difference in European classical music, if you're feeling a certain way on a certain day, you go to your repertoire, your literature, and you pull out this piece by whomever, and you play this piece because that's the way you feel. In jazz, you pick up your instrument, or you sit down to your instrument in my case, and you let these notes come. And these notes, which are new, no notes are actually new, but the combination of the way you place them is, is, is your style. And that personal expression, to me, uh, is very important. And you get lost in it. Especially when you're playing with either a group or someone, in this case Billy Taylor, when we play these two piano concerts, who is inspiring because of the way he projects his music, and challenging because he's, it's a give and take. It's not a duel. It's like, okay, we're going to play this song, and since I'm going to play the first chorus, here's the way I feel about it. And you say, oh, all right. Well, here's the way I feel about it, the second chorus. And it, you get lost in the music, and it's during rehearsals and it's during performances at night that you make, that make it all worthwhile. I mean, the long plane trips, the limousines, and the hotel rooms, you forget about that. You know, you're talking about the classical influences, the, the gospel influences. Uh, so much seems to, there's so much that jazz seems to bring together in terms of musical genre. Also brings a lot of different aspects of people together, is what it seems to me anyway. Uh, it seems like jazz is kind of a wonderful unifying force. It is. Um, you get to speak your own voice, but especially in a group, you have to find your place in the group. And to find your, your, your musical place, how do you fit in? You have to learn about the other members, what their contribution is. And you, it's interesting because you have to maintain your personal voice. If you're playing in a trio, quintet, whatever, duo, you have to maintain what you personally feel. But at the same time, you're reacting to what else is going on around you. And when the other person or the other persons are performing, it's up to you to support them, encourage what they're doing, but at the same time, stay out of the way. Now, it sounds like two extremes, um, but not really. It's um, very democratic. I mean, you get to put your two cents in. and uh, you're, you're At the same time, you're, you're part of the whole, but you're an individual. One of the things I, I want to ask you about is, uh, and Dr. Taylor talked about this, you've been honored for working with young people and uh, bringing them along in, into music. Why is that so important to you? Sounds like a real commitment that you have to, to share this with others. Yeah, when I was coming up, um, I went to a public high school, and this high school had um, a marching band, it had a concert band, it had an uh, orchestra, um, mixed chorus, girls chorus, boys. I mean, we just had all these great things. An art department that did sceneries for our for our. Show, for our spring festivals. The instruments were provided. Um, and music, music and art was so important to, to the kids. There were some uh, students, had it not been for the fact that there was a rehearsal for the spring show, they might not have come to class. But one of the prerequisites to be in the show was you had to get C's or better, or B's or better, or whatever. You had to so there was this inspiration. I find nowadays that this isn't available to kids in the inner city. Also, which is very important, is when I was coming up, there were places we could go to meet the masters and say hello to Oscar Peterson, say hello to Errol Garner. And if you like London House, which is a restaurant, one of the few places that if, because they serve food, you could go there if, if you're underage. But you've got to say, how did you do this? How did you play that? In fact, Oscar Peterson was very kind when I met him. 
and was asking him these questions. He said, well, why don't you stop by the hotel tomorrow afternoon, and I'll show you these things. Well, you don't get that in, in this day and time. Things have changed. Um, so I think that it's important that those of us who have experienced certain things uh, share and give back, because that's what was happening with us. But it's not available to kids these days. So I encourage people of any profession, not just musicians, um, but doctors, lawyers, businessmen, whatever field, I encourage them to take an hour out every now and then and, and go sit with some kids. I, what's inspiring is when we started the Ravinia Mentors Program in Chicago, um, the first time I went to one of these um, classes, we were just, it was start, it's only three years old now, um, it was on the south side, uh, and I walked in, and the kids didn't believe that I was there, that I would come. I mean, they were just, you actually took time out of your schedule to come see us? I mean, us? I mean, well, of course, you're important. And they became so energized that they inspired me. I mean, I'm there to inspire them, but what they were giving to me was so inspirational. Uh, we now have uh, the Venia Mentor Program where we have six professional, uh, internationally known jazz musicians who go out to ten high schools. I think there's uh, each mentor visits at least the same school at least four or five different times to work with the band director. Uh, but to share their experience, to share their technique and um, their life on the road or with that, this or that musician. And we're quite proud of it now because we're attracting corporate sponsorship. The word is getting out that these schools and these kids individually respond. Um, we have tools like uh, a cassette record of our mentors playing, sort of a mu music minus one, where if you play trumpet, there's a cassette you can take home where the trumpet part is missing on one side. On the other side, the trumpet part is there to give you an idea what it's supposed to sound like. There's music. It's inspiring to me to know that there's something that I can give back to the community. There's something, and you know, giving back material things is important. But I think giving of yourself is just as important. And one without the other is meaningless. sounds like in addition to you know, passing on the musical traditions, passing on the musical knowledge, you also talk about values as you sit down and talk to these guys. That's true. Um, when the mentors uh, go out to the schools and talking and teaching jazz, you're, you're teaching kids how to focus and on something, on one thing and learn that. You're teaching them uh, to be on time. You're teaching them to, while you're developing your individual uh, um, art, you're teaching them, well, you're part of the saxophone section. Now, what are the other guys doing? Because they're just as important to you. Um, you're teaching them, not homework in this case, but to take the music home on your own and learn it. So what's happening here, we don't assume that all these kids are going to go out and be the next Duke Ellingtons or the next George Gershwins. But I think the values that we are teaching them, they can take to any profession. Um, being on time, being alert, being committed, making, making a commitment and then following through with it. So we're very proud of our program. I, I encourage that. I was with a group uh, with some friends um, uh, yesterday, and um, one is, is an artist, and the other is just a business, just a business person. <laughs> and it's important that kids know. It's funny when when people get up and speak in front of a group of kids, and kids see that most times he or she went through. Uh, sometimes not an easy time to get where they are. Uh, and kids can say, yeah, well, I can do that. Or, yeah, this is worth it. That's awesome. We're coming to the end of this. Uh, what, 
what would you say has been the most satisfying thing about the life that you you've ended up leading so far? Probably the most satisfying thing is uh, being able to do what I love to do um, and make a living at it. There's times when it feels so good I don't want to accept the paycheck, but I take it anyway. Um, as I look around the world and see what people end up doing with their lives, I think probably the greatest blessing is that I'm able to sit at the piano, which I love to do, and um, earn a living at that. And being able to make a commitment, I mean make a, a contribution, being able to make a contribution back to society. So at one time I'm gratifying, I feel gratified in myself personally, and on the other hand, I feel very gratified when I walk away from one of these meetings with these 12 or 15 kids and see the smiles on their faces that maybe something I said motivated them. Reminds me, you could have easily been a minister the way you talk. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Dad um, wasn't a minister, but um, he was a very important uh, person in our church. He was a choir director for years and years, and so we went to church quite often. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I could be a minister. My sister, my older sister, uh, Reverend Jackson, in fact, is um, she's a co-pastor with Reverend Mitchell of uh, the James Memorial AME Church in Chicago, and she's been a, a minister for 25 years. And my, it's my older sister. My younger sister is the minister of music at our church. Um, so the spiritual direction is there. The spiritual life is acknowledged. Um, are there any new directions in your music that you that uh, that you're thinking about taking, or do they just or do they just happen? Well, they sort of just happen. Uh, you have to first send out the thought, send out the feeling that, hmm, what am I going to do next? And then don't force it. Just kind of keep it on your mind and sit around the piano and what, what do I want to do next? And uh, there's a project on the table right now that um, I will do uh, jazz interpretations of operatic arias with uh, 18-piece concert band, uh, which was inspired, I must say, by the collaboration of Gil Evans, Miles Davis, uh, who did some great work a few years ago. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much. I really have enjoyed this. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Is there you. anything I might not have touched upon that you'd like to, like to say? Uh, you're quite thorough. I think we got a good one here. <laughs>